All right, we're looking at the book of Ezekiel, and we've talked about the prophet, and we've talked a little bit about who he's prophesying to. Ezekiel is a prophet primarily to the Babylonian Jews. The, there were Jews who had been taken into exile, and he was prophesying to them. You can split the book down into three sections. In chapters 1 through 24, he's prophesying before Jerusalem falls. In uh, chapters 25 to 32, he's prophesying as Jerusalem falls. And in chapters 33 through 48, he's prophesying after Jerusalem falls. And so, obviously, first of all, God's people needed to know why Jerusalem was going to fall. And God is so patient because he, he really has explained this before. But he's going to explain it again through Ezekiel. And so, in chapters 1 through 11, God makes a series of accusations against his people. When you begin reading Ezekiel, Ezekiel, you see that it starts with a very strange vision. Ezekiel's about 30, he's living in, or he is 30, he's living in Babylon, and he receives a vision of the glory of God. This is his birthday, and he's probably a little sad because on your 30th birthday, if you were in the priestly line, you were supposed to start working as a priest, but he's living in Babylon. And so he's not going to be able to go to the temple in Jerusalem. And so the temple basically comes to him. He can't go to the temple, so the temple comes to him. Ezekiel 1.1, 1, 1, the heavens open, and Ezekiel sees a visible manifestation of God. And there's some strange parts of this vision. There are these living creatures who have four of everything, wings, faces. Why? So they can face every direction. And there's a wheel within a wheel that he talks about, which he emphasizes can go in every direction without turning. It's like a soccer ball, a sphere. And what's the point? It's going to have to do with God's presence eventually. It's, it's showing us that God's presence can go wherever he wants it to go. And as we see this description of the glory of God in these creatures and we look more closely, we see the words that are used are a lot like creation words, Edenish words. He talks about expanse or firmament. And there are other words that share similarities with manifestations of God at Mount Sinai and also especially with the way he appeared above the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. And so Ezekiel's seen a mobile temple, basically. A temple on wheels, which obviously was going to expand his mind. You know, I thought the temple was back there in Jerusalem, but God's able to bring the temple to me. And yet it's also going to create some questions like, what is God's presence doing here in Babylon? Which God begins to answer in chapters 2 and 3 as Ezekiel is commissioned. He has been chosen by God to go to the people and accuse them of breaking the covenant and to warn them of what's coming as a result. We see at the end of chapter 1, Ezekiel's response to the vision of God is to fall on his face. When I saw it, I fell on my face. And I'm sure that was a straight fall, like he must have had bruises on his face. And he can't move until verse 1 of chapter 2, where God speaks to Ezekiel and tells him to get up. And as he's speaking, the Spirit of God has to enter him in order to enable him to stand, which is amazing. Here it's his birthday and he's sad because he can't go to the temple and so the temple comes to him and even better the spirit of God enters him which means he becomes what? He becomes a kind of temple. And so there's this goal we're going to see of God doing something really big with his presence bigger than Israel imagined and yet for that to happen there needs to be a judgment because of how sinful Israel had become. We'll see as we read Ezekiel that the primary reason for this coming judgment is represented by a word that occurs eight times or so, and that is God's jealousy over Israel's idolatry. This is the issue in the book of Ezekiel. Other gods have taken the place of Yahweh, and that's why they're having all the problems that they're having. This is the theme that drives the whole book, and it drives it, as someone has said, in judgmental terms. The intensity of God's wrath at threats to his relationship with his people is proportional to the depths of his covenant love. In other words, because God loves so deeply, his anger fires up so hotly. His bride has gone after other gods, and this is the natural and right response of a husband who loves his wife, right? Right? 
But of course, God never expresses his wrath with glee. It's always with great pain. And so one of the illustration of Ezekiel's hostility towards idolatry, God's hostility towards idolatry, is the very choice of words he uses to describe the idols. His favorite word for idols in the book of Ezekiel is not a word that is often used for idols in the rest of the, the Old Testament. He, instead, he uses a word that comes from a root that means to roll, from which we get round things, and it was a word that was used elsewhere of excrement, round things. What is this word? The most common domestic animal in those days was sheep and, uh, were sheep and goats. And you know what the droppings of sheep and goats look like? Peanuts, round things. And that's what he's talking about. That's his favorite word for idols. You can be sure his audience would have been shocked. They should have been. Why does he use this word for idols? There's no other way to get through. This is what you're worshiping. Round things, peanuts, sheep droppings. After commissioning Ezekiel in chapters 2 and 3 to this work, God sends Ezekiel out to proclaim the message. And he begins with a series of signs in chapters 4 through 6. It's almost like Ezekiel is going to have to perform street theater here. God knew the people would have a hard time listening, so he makes it very clear through physical pictures of the coming of judgment that he's going to pour out his wrath on Jerusalem. He had to build a tiny model of Jerusalem and then stage an attack on it. He has to lay on one side for 390 days, and then he has to get up and lay on the other side for 40 more days. And God puts cords on him so that he can't turn from one side to the other. And this is very strange, but what's happening is that God is making Ezekiel a picture of Israel. This is what is going to happen to Israel and to Judah. There was another time that he would have to chop off his hair, which was going to be shameful in those days. And then he puts his hair on the scales and he divides it into thirds. And then he burns some of the hair. He strikes the other third with a sword and the other third is scattered to the wind. Now a third plus a third plus a third, how much is that? That's everything. And that's what God is saying is going to happen to Israel. You're all going to die. And yet what does he do? He puts a little bit in his pocket. And everyone's like, good, there is hope. But what does he do next? He throws most of what's in his pocket into the fire. And so he's saying only a few are going to be left. And then there was still one more occasion, probably the worst, where he had to lie on his side for over a year and eat food that was cooked over poop to show how long Israel was going to be held captive and the kind of suffering they would experience when they were held captive like that. And maybe the hardest thing in the middle of all of this is that God made it clear to Ezekiel that no one was going to listen to him. In chapter 6 and 7, God gives Ezekiel a devastating message of judgment to proclaim to the people, basically saying, this is how you're going to die. They're going to execute you in front of your idols. And what's the point? The idols are there watching, and they can't do anything. They can't save you. And then in chapters 8 through 11, he shows them, why this was necessary, and really what was at the heart of the judgment itself. In a vision, he takes Ezekiel on a virtual tour of the temple. And in the outer courtyard, he sees an idol. Then he sees elders worshiping idols in and outside the temple, and the women doing the same thing as well. There's even a secret compartment in the temple where they keep the idols. And remember, the temple's called the house of God. So this is like if you have a house with your wife and there's a room where you keep someone you're committing adultery with. It's disgusting. Which is why it's not surprising that Ezekiel sees another vision of the glory of God. And this time the glory of God's leaving the temple and it's going east and is going towards Babylon. It's like God's packing up and leaving. And so in chapter 11, we see why God's glory had appeared to Ezekiel in Babylon. Israel's idolatry and rebellion had driven the glory of God away from the temple, but in spite of their sin and hard-heartedness, God hadn't yet abandoned his people, but it's like he goes into exile with them. God promises that he will return a remnant of Israel back to the land, and he will transform them. And you see that in chapter 11, verse 16. After this word of hope, the next three sections in Ezekiel are basically 
announcements of judgment. First, in chapters 12 through 24, judgment on Israel. Israel has lots of excuses as to why this can't happen. In chapter 12, once again, Ezekiel has to symbolize what's going to happen to the king of Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem by living like a refugee in the middle of a group of refugees. And then he was supposed to eat his food trembling in order to symbolize the kind of fear the residents of Jerusalem would soon experience as they came under attack. And he's saying, this is going to happen. Then in chapter 13, God has to send Ezekiel to condemn the false prophets who were encouraging the people to continue on in their rebellion instead of humbling themselves before God. He's saying, your prophets can't help you. God then confronts the leaders of Israel in chapter 14 for setting up and worshiping idols in their hearts, and he warns them of the judgment he's going to bring on those who continue to deceive his people. The chapter ends with God justifying the judgment he's going to send on Judah, and he says, your priests and your leaders can't save you. Then in chapters 15 and following, he uses a series of illustrations to help un them understand why this judgment had to come. The first is that of Judah being like a useless vine. It's a funny picture. What good is a vine for building? None. You can't use a vine for doing construction work, obviously. You can only use it for fire, but once the fire has consumed it, what can be done with it? Nothing. And he's saying that's Jerusalem. It's like a vine. You can't use a vine for anything but fire, and it's been burned up. The second illustration he gives is of a faithless bride. Pretty, there's a, there's a beautiful picture of God's love and care for this woman who then becomes after all this love and care, decides to become a whore, and God says he's going to judge. But then the chapter ends with a note of hope, and that is of God's faithfulness to his covenant, even in spite of his bride's lack of faithfulness. And you can see this in chapter 16, verses 59 through 63. And basically, he's walking them through their whole history and saying, you failed, you failed, you deserve this judgment. And then in chapter 17, there's a story about two eagles and a vine, and it's about their kings, basically. They, and he's saying they can't trust in their prophets. They can't trust in their priests. And God says, you can't trust in your kings either. Your kings are going to be taken away. But, Ezekiel 17, 22 through 24, once again, God gives hope. He's going to send a great king who's going to fix what Israel had broken. In chapter 18, God makes it clear the people are so dead that they won't respond to these warnings with repentance, but instead excuses. And they say, God, you're not fair. You're not fair. You're not fair. And so God's like, you have to understand your sins individually have condemned you. So don't blame your fathers. You did this. But of course, people are still finding a way to, to hope that this won't happen. The people hear what God said about them being punished for their sins, but they're still hoping in Zedekiah, who was king, and thinking he might be able to find a way to deliver Jerusalem in spite of what Ezekiel said. So here, Ezekiel laments over what God has promised would happen to Zedekiah, and he uses this image of a wild lion and a vine. There's a lioness who has cubs. That's Israel, and the cubs are princes or leaders. The first cub is a king who rules and then is captured and taken to Egypt. That's Jehoahaz. And so the nation picked another, and that is Jehoiachin. And he pictures Jehoiachin as a lion that is causing damage to the people all around him until he causes so much damage that the people decide to capture him and make him unable to do any more damage. He writes, Then the nation set against him from provinces on every side. They spread their net over him. He was taken into their pit with hooks. They put him in a cage and brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him into custody that his voice should not be heard on the mountains of Israel. Then he uses the image of a vine. This is Zedekiah, and he was not really a legitimate king, which is maybe why the image switches from a lion to a vine. And Ezekiel describes what's, what's going to happen to Zedekiah and the nation by saying that vine was plucked up in fury, cast down to the ground. Now it's planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land, that's Babylon, and fire has gone out from the stem of its shoots, has consumed its fruit, so that there remains in it no strong scepter, no scepter from ruling. So he's saying there's, there's not going to be a king in Israel. And that's devastating given the Davidic covenant. And the point of all this, of course, though, is that they shouldn't be putting their hope in kings, but instead be putting their hope in God. It's so hard to get people to hope in God. God's the only one who can save you, Ezekiel's saying. And you know what you need to do? You need to repent. But they won't repent. And so in chapters 20 through 23, we get more descriptions of 
Judah's sin and more proofs of how certain judgment is. In chapter 20, the elders come to Ezekiel once again and God says he's not going to listen to them as long as they're living in rebellion to him and calls on Ezekiel to describe their sins to them. And God here is going to give them a historical review of where they've come from and what exactly has brought them to this point. He begins back in Egypt. Even though God rescued them from Egypt, told them not to worship idols, they worshiped idols immediately. And this text actually tells us some things we, we didn't know from Genesis and Exodus. At that point, God could have judged them, but he acted for the sake of his name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived. So he showed mercy, and he delivered them and gave them his rules and laws, but they wouldn't obey. Again, God could have punished them and finished it in the wilderness, but he acted for the sake of his name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations. And so though he did punish them, he spared their children and came to their children and pleaded with them to obey him, but they wouldn't. And he could have punished them at that point, but he acted for the sake of his name, that it should not be profaned among the nations and brought them into the land. But he also warned them that he would judge them in the future by casting them out of the land if they persisted in their disobedience. And he gave them over to their sins to experience the devastating consequences of those sins so they would learn not to sin but not only did they commit idolatry and not learn what they should have learned they persisted in this idolatry they loved it and Ezekiel tells the elders who came to him that they were doing the same thing even still and as a result God would not allow himself to be inquired of by them but God says he won't let the people be given over to idolatry and that through his judgment and wrath, he's going to do a mighty work in the people of Israel. First, judgment. This is verses 34 to 36 of uh, chapter 20. What is in your mind shall never happen. The thought, let us be like the nations, like the tribes of the countries, and worship wood and stone. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you're scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. I will purge out the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So judgment, you... And then salvation. As a pleasing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you've been scattered and I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations and you shall know that I'm the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, the country that I swore to give to your fathers. Then in chapter 21, he tells Ezekiel to preach judgment. He says, God's gonna bring out his sword and judge Israel so that everyone will know he's the Lord. He's starting to hear the pattern. God wants his people to know and he wants everyone to know that he is God. He calls on Ezekiel to respond to this message by weeping and groaning and crying. And when people look at him and they see him crying and they ask why he's crying, he's telling them, he's to tell them because of the news that is coming, every heart will melt and all hands will be feeble, feeble, every spirit will faint, all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it's coming and it will be fulfilled, declares the Lord God. God explains why he has to use the sword. You have despised the rod, my son, with everything of wood. Cry out and wail, son of man, for it's against the people. It's against all the princes of Israel. They are delivered over the sword with my people. Strike it, therefore, upon your thigh, for it will not be a testing. What could it do if you despise the rod? What could I do if you despise the rod, declares the Lord. God says, I tried. I tried to discipline you, but you wouldn't listen. So now comes the sword. And he goes into some detail about the judgment that's going to happen. Ezekiel is supposed to make a, a map which identifies two different ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to come. Both are to start from the same place. Then he's supposed to make a signpost that stands at the head of the city. From here is uh, to mark a way for Rabbah. Uh, and another is to mark a way to go to Judah. So there's to be a signpost that shows these two different ways that the king of Babylon could go. And Nebuchadnezzar has to make a decision. Which way am I supposed to go? And Nebuchadnezzar would then stop and try to decide which way to go, and he would use various omens. After casting lots, Jerusalem would come up, but it would seem like a false omen to him, to the people of Judah who have sworn allegiance to him, and yet they've broken their treaty to him, and so Nebuchadnezzar will remind them of what they've done and why they deserve to be punished. Long story short, 
Ezekiel's prophesying the siege of Jerusalem really, really specifically using all this uh, imagery. And God basically says in verse 24, this is right. Verse 25, he tells Zedekiah, you're not going to be a king any longer. The one who's high priest won't be a high priest any longer. And it's going to be for a long time like this. It's going to, you're not going to have a king or a high priest for a long time. God says in verse 26 and 27, though, things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low. Bring low that which is exalted. A ruin, a ruin, I will make it. This also shall not be until he comes, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. And that's a really important verse. He's going to take the turban and the crown off of someone, the king. Those things represent his kingship. And it also might represent priesthood, actually, turban. And no one's going to have it until what comes or who comes. The Messiah, the king's going to fall until someone comes who resurrects the line. That's the prophecy there. And in chapter, in verses 28 and following, God has Ezekiel use the Ammonites' reproach of Judah and uses that as a statement of judgment on Judah. The Ammonites were saying, a sword, a sword is drawn for the slaughter. It's polished to consume and to flash like lightning while they see for you false visions, while they divine lies for you. And the Ammonites are speaking about Judah there. And then they turn to speak to Babylon in verse 30. They say, return it to its sheath, speaking of the sword of judgment. In the place where you were created, in the land of your origin, I will judge you. And who's the you here? He's speaking of the one who is holding the sword of judgment, and that's Babylon. So God's saying, I'm going to use Babylon through the Ammonites. God's saying, I'm going to use Babylon to judge Israel, Judah, and then I'm going to judge Babylon. And in chapter 22, God once again has Ezekiel explaining why God is judging Jerusalem this way. And he basically brings them back to the Mosaic Covenant, and he shows them God has clearly told them how to live, and they have hard-heartedly chosen to ignore his instructions. And he stresses that those who are most accountable are those who were chosen to give leadership and who failed to do so. And so he just starts walking through all the reasons why they were getting this judgment and especially the leadership would be judged. And it was for idolatry, it was for violence, it was for dishonoring of parents, it was for lack of concern for strangers, it was for taking advantage of or orphans, it was for greed, taking advantage of others for money, it was because of prophets who used their position to disadvantage others, it was because of priests who weren't concerned about the law of God, it was because of kings who were violent for money, and then he comes back to the prophets, and it was because of prophets who say what people wanted to hear and claim to speak for God when they really were just saying whatever people wanted them to say. And then he talks about the people again, and he says they're greedy, they oppress the poor, they've abused the refugee, and God looked for just one righteous man who might serve as their representative, Ezekiel twenty-two thirty, but he couldn't find one. And so in chapter 23, God uses an illustration of two promiscuous sisters to describe the sins of both Israel and Judah. And as you can tell, God's just coming after the people over and over and exposing how sinful they've been. And it, it sometimes feels like too much. But that's the point, isn't it? We don't take sin very seriously. And God's having to go to great lengths to show us just how serious sin really is and so he talks about two women who played the whore in egypt one was the older sister and the other was the younger sister and in spite of their whoring god chose them they became his and he describes the way samaria sinned after god entered into a relationship with them the northern kingdom the picture is of a woman who's just sinning with anyone she comes into contact with and god says eventually because of your consistent unwillingness to give up your whoring he just delivers her into the hands of her lovers. So the consequence or the judgment for sin is God just giving them over to their sin. But instead of learning from the consequences of Israel's sin, Jerusalem looked at what Israel did and tried to outdo them in sinning. God then goes on to describe how Jerusalem sinned against him. At a certain point, their whoring becomes so flagrant that God says, when she carried on her whoring so openly and flaunted her nakedness, I turned in disgust from her as I turned in disgust from her sister. Yet even that didn't stop her. She just continued her whoring. And once again, the judgment for her sin was God giving her up. Behold, I will stir up against you your lovers from whom you turned in disgust, and I will bring them against you from every side. And God then tells Ezekiel once again to identify the sins of Israel and Jerusalem. And in case we're confused, he says, 
With their idols, they've committed adultery. They've offered up their children as sacrifices. They would worship idols in gross ways. They would sacrifice their children, and then they would come in and pretend to worship God as if nothing were wrong. And the chapter concludes with God saying that because Israel and Jerusalem lived their lives out as adulteresses and would not repent, they would receive the judgment of adulteresses. The goal of this judgment being that they would stop sinning and that they would finally understand what it meant for him to be God. God, it, he wants to rescue his people and he wants to rescue them through this judgment. Ezekiel, the first chapters of Ezekiel, I told you this, they're dark. A lot of sin, a lot of judgment. But remember, it has to be dark. The bad news has to come so that we can understand the good news, which is still, still going to come in the book of Ezekiel and we'll learn more about in videos to follow.